The San Francisco Bay Area is located within the ancestral home and unceded territory of the Penland, Ramatush, Ohlone peoples, and the coastal Miwok. We remember their connection to this region and give thanks for the opportunity to live and love in the Bay Area. Lani Ka'ahamanu is a Kanaka Maoli and stands with the Hawaiian sovereignty movement. As a mixed heritage, bisexuality challenges the socially constructed assumptions of race, sex, gender, orientation, and whatever else keeps us from fully being and expressing ourselves. Start today with calling the ancestors and dedicate this conference to the memories of the beloved San Francisco Bay Area Bicross activists and community organizers. Dr. David Gloria, Dr. Alan Rockaway, Cynthia Slater, Brian Young, Margo Rila, Pat Stewart, Ron Rocamonte, Andy Tom, Douglas Garanon, JD, Charles Berrigan III, Scott Lofgren, Spring Freelander, Sally Binford, Jack Random, Joel Holt, the Reverend Dr. Abraham Elias Ferjade, and our 89-year-old matriarch, Dr. Maggie Rubinstein, who is the founder of the SFI Center. And um, we have a book here. Um, where you can write a message to many. Check out, she's an activist since 1969 through into the 2000s. She was at every meeting in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, with fists in the air saying, and bisexual. So um, <laughs> please write it up to her and I can mail it back. The Bipolis community has had a growing presence in the Bay Area since the mid 60s. Out by sessions within the Central Beautifully, National Sex Forum, San Francisco Sex Information, the Institute for the Advanced Study of Human Sexuality, the Radical Therapy Collective, the Gay Liberation Fund, the Civil Rights Peace and Women's Movement, built the foundation for the now stand. I'm going to read a poem that I wrote in 1994, Go to Speech. It'll help ground me in us. And this was a conference of uh, academics, professors, students, administrators, and it was a gay lesbian conference. One year they put the B in there, struggle for the C's. The next year they pulled out the B from the gay lesbian conference. And so, uh, uh, Jenny Demon, the my trans actress, said, Enough of that, and she organized the next conference and it had BMT in it. I did a keynote, and this is how I ended my speech. It's called That Naked Place. For now, I look you in the eye and say, I will not be the skeleton in our family. I will not be your homo or heterosexual assumptions. I will not be your scapegoat. I will not be controlled. I will not be contained, and I will not. I am spontaneous combustion. I have fluid motion seeking your compliment. I have language searching for new meaning. I have social construction looking for change. I have a sexual borderline back, bandit, a traitor to the cause. I am in law and outlaw connected at her step. I am your nitty gritty, raw naked to the bone, shameless, fluid desire to come home. I am your primal cream. I am your unfolded dream. I am beyond primal. I am sexual without category. I am sexual without gendered reference points, writing the chemistry as it unfolds. I am a free range chicken. <laughs> Don't fence me. I can copy you to do your do and lay in the best of your hands. <laughs> <laughs> I have a crisscross hopscotch, and ready or not, here I come both to cross the radical and a swiftly shifting paradigm heading for the next If I pass for other than what I am, do you feel safer? I ask where do you draw your lines? Who's back for what? 
money, if you want to give a little bit more background in the future, or you can give a cash. Oh, cash. Yes. So in um, in the early 90s, the, the internet was like, who's out there who's mainly at college, in colleges and universities? Um, I was in college at the time in Santa Cruz, and I remember at the time there, were, there was only like a bulletin board. And for those who don't know what a bulletin board is, it's, it's a very simple, like text based system where people post messages. Really simple. So there was a, a, by, um, a, a by bulletin board. So when, we, when I came here and I moved to, to San Francisco, it was like in 94. That's when. If anyone remembers the browser of Mosaic, so <laughs> what's that? You know, it's like a precursor to our current internet browsers. So the, the information just wasn't as widely disseminated as it is now. So that's why I thought the value of the magazine, one, one goal I had for the magazine, I was looking for all the old issues, getting all nostalgic, is that I really wanted to look at bisexuality from all these different angles. And I wanted to, Kind of push the limits to, to try to like get out there, push it even further and further. I think that was important. Um, but as the internet became more and more widespread and popular, more and more information got out there, eventually the needs changed. The magazine ended in 1999, and I would say one of the reasons, besides the staff wanting to do other things and burnout, was that. It wasn't needed. <laughs> it wasn't needed as much because there was other forms of information. And same with the support group. I know there's a support group now, which is awesome. But at that time, I, I noticed that the attendance became less and less. And I think that's just because there was more accessibility to meet other bisexuals. So let's talk about technology. When I, I was an organizer, I was an organizer in the 60s. As a housewife in San Mateo, I was a member of the team, collected food for the Black Times of Breakfast program, got involved with Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers, and um, was another member for peace. Um, in, uh, where was the um, in the, uh, I came out of the lesbian in 76 after my divorce, um, and for four years helped found the Women's Studies Department and was an organizer in the feminist movement. In um, 1980, I graduated from women's studies, went up to a new age resort up in Mendocino, became the chef, the kitchen manager at the Village Oz, uh, clothing optional, who were new age, <laughs> and my feminist posters up. And um, the second summer I was there, this young man came and tried to be room. And uh, uh, by that time, my burnout for being an activist in the 70s was healed. And um, I was really hungry to get back to the city and organize. And um, I had heard some feminist connection. And here's this young guy, 15 years younger. And he goes, wow, he goes, he goes, have you ever read A Woman Born, which is the most radical Book written on motherhood, and uh, I said, "Yeah." Well, that was his great pickup line. I just had to say <laughs> <laughs> because I just are you kidding me? And he goes, "No, I'm on you. I read it. I'm so excited about it." So um, we fell in love in that situation, and um, he kept saying, uh, "I kept saying I can't be bisexual. There's no such thing." Anyway. Um, eventually, of course, um, I knew I had to come back to the city, to my lesbian community, and uh, friends, and um, I knew it would be horrible, really hard, because I was really much more with lesbian, and I kind of felt the current wheel of life biting me in the butt. And um, so I went to the bisexual center. I'll get to the thing and I'll do stuff. <laughs> but I went to the bisexual center. There's a bisexual center from 1976 to 1984. We have somebody from the bisexual center here. Raise your hand. She'll be visiting. Joanne Cloudholder. And um, so I went to a coming out group there for women. And 
I sat in this group, and um, all the questions were things like, well, how do you ask a woman to dance? How, how do you kiss? How do you... All, it was all about that part. My question is, what do I do with this man? And so I realized this is a community that, for my support, I really needed to be in a lesbian engagement. Because I could answer all their questions and they couldn't answer mine. And so I went back and I started organizing. Bill and I started looking for other people, other bisexual women, to start building a bisexual community and movement. We wanted the movement, but you can't have a movement without a visual community. So the politics of the 80s was organized in the community. And um, we did a lot, we founded Bipol in 19, uh, 1983, and it was, we did a lot of street theater. We did a lot of have fun, period. If anybody's going to join you, we've got to have fun and food. And a little bit of sex helps. And a little bit of sex. A little bit of sex. Was that yeah. sex? We're talking about like in the 80s? No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind, of, it's kind of a joke with the shadow of AIDS was starting to come. Uh, gay cancer, and red, and people were getting sick and dying within a few weeks. Weeks. So all of a sudden, this booming community in the Castro and the women's community was on Valencia Street. It was kind of an interesting thing because the bisexual community organizing was on Noe. All the a lot of major uh, leaders in the bi community were on Noe Street. So you had the gay men here, the bisexuals here, and on Valencia was a lesbian, <laughs> <laughs> which we would laugh about, but. Um, but the, uh, the, the cloud of people just started to die, you know, like the person that waited on you at the post office, or, you know, people all of a sudden are homeless or dying. I guess it was really, I can't even, you know, I say it, and then I stopped counting and 100 people died. I mean, that's how it, it was like, you can't even imagine it. Now I can't imagine it, and I lived through it. So we were organizing the visibility of bisexual people who were one of the biggest scapegoats. Still happening. Still happening. That, you know, we, we spread AIDS to the straight community. They were saying that on TV. Newsweek had a, had a big uh, bisexual thing. We would be uh, pariahs of the AIDS. I mean, it was really brutal to come out as bisexual then, especially if you were a man, especially if you were a man. So um, a lot of our organizing was around uh, support, but having visible street theater, which really helped a lot because um, if you're brave enough to come out, you know, it's like we welcome everybody. And technology then, here's the technology. Okay, figure out this. There is no, no, we have rotary phones, <coughs> word of mouth, Palm trees, mimeograph machines, mail mail. For visibility communication, we had letters to the editor, calendar notices in local newspapers. There was no answering machines, no copy machines, no faxing, no scan capabilities, no computers, no internet, no email. So there was a lot of one on one organizing, a lot. Uh, the phone tree, what a phone tree is, is you have a list of 10 people you have to call. In contact about a meeting about a meeting. That's how it worked. And you just had to call it. Some people paid for an answer to service. So you could leave a message. But mostly the organizing was um, very different. It was very exciting. We didn't know what was to come. I remember when fax machines showed up and was like, oh. <laughs> we didn't have to fax, you know, it was like to get something somewhere. Um, Lonnie, I'll say that even in the 90s and probably to the present, I would make um, phone calls to the staff being like, oh yeah, what are you meeting tomorrow? And that really helped increase the, um, the number of people who came. So there's something about that personal connection that makes a huge difference, but it is a lot of work. It's kind of irritating. Yeah, you just can't like push this button. I'm like, I, every once in a while I think about all oh, that action we did, my God. We would have thousands of people there, it feels like, if we could have gotten a hold of people. Um, we marched to the parade in 1984. It was a giant year here for bisexuals. 
May the Bipole organize the contingents in the parade and uh, Mayor Diane Feinstein and her Mayor Diane Feinstein has never been in the parade. She refused to be in the parade in the car, right? So we had Mayor Brian Feinstein and Princess Vi from London, who was pregnant, sitting on a big Oldsmobile red convertible. And the banner on the front of the car said, Welcome to the San Francisco Vi area. And they sat on the back, they did a character study of Diane. She always had that kind of with Tom on the audience called Planet of the Apes Hairdo. It's like a little silk clothes. And uh, so we had Mayor Ryan and Princess Pi welcome you. And they did the whole, you know, the whole thing through the parade and we marched with five detectors and five belts for human rights. And there was um, my high school daughter that was a they had big giant cut out of teeth. And they were uh, white custards. They <laughs> were everywhere. <laughs> and I always marched by and large. So um, we had so much fun that there was no fences then. So you could jump in and out from the street. So by the end, we were like about 100 people and ended up with like about almost 30 people joined us, just like that. So the, and of course, we collect names. We collected names and phone numbers. That's how we grew. So built up the community also in 84 for visibility there was a lot of there was a lot of uh, extra media in town because uh, the democratic convention was happening two weeks after pride and, then, and jerry falwell with the moral majority was also in town with the conference it was a and jesse jackson was running for president then and the rainbow coalition and so Alan Rockway, who was a, an incredible media person, he said, he was the city, if you can imagine this, the city provided a protest stage during the convention. And in front of Moscone, there was a parking lot where there's a, you know, the other half of Moscone Center now. Anyway, we had this, uh, I ran as the first out by second vice president. He picked Geraldine Ferraro. Oh, well. But um, <laughs> we got a lot of press. We made it in political cartoons. There was Kirk Kane was a columnist, and he, he wrote up what was going on. The point was visibility. Got to interview the press because the press is always looking for stories, the wacky stories. And so um, we actually got bisexual visibility there, and then um, we had a bisexual rights rally also at that protest stage and it was um there were like 10 speakers and performers and all this great stuff and there was a vast parking lot and so you up on stage with the banners and you turn it around and there's like probably 20 people in our audience but it was the first bisexual rights rally and um there was also at the same time a gay and lesbian march on a Democratic National Convention from Castro to the convention. No bisexuals were allowed to march. We were told we could not march against them. We could be bystanders along the way, whatever. Um, so, uh, but we thought our bisexual rights rally was going to be so big. We had a big soda water thing we were selling for fundraiser. They didn't plan on that, so all the lesbian gay folks came in and sold out as the biggest fundraiser bisexuals had ever had. <laughs> so it worked out really perfect. Anyway, um, so that's what Bipole would do these kind of outrageous things, along with we were doing HIV education, safe sex education. David Laurier was, and Cynthia Slater were in the uh, bathhouses and um, the BDSM clubs in the early 80s starting safe sex education and there was a bumper sticker around that said save sex so for some people pulled totally away from even being sexual. Um, and David Laurier was on Feinstein's very first uh, AIDS education commission. So there was a lot of visibility within the health departments of uh, bisexual people. Um, also organizing at that time were various people of color communities that were coming up and getting organized too. And so and many bisexual people of color 
didn't get involved in the bisexual identity movement. And so we were all networked with each other, especially during the AIDS, HIV AIDS. We didn't have any sort of um, a test. If you find your timeline, it was 85 before you could go get a test. You can find out if you had it. So there was that, that part too. Um, so Bible was the political. But how are we doing on time? I would really love the questions. That seems to be good. Uh, they had a bisexual network at the time. Anne Jasley was the founder. She went to the East Coast Bisexual Network conference and came back and said, we can do that here. And she started organizing and I became one of the early people in that event. It's all on the timeline. So the event started um, in 87 with the speakers bureau with training, retreats. Uh, monthly educational forums like Justice is your favorite, favorite bisexual and come to this history forum and talk about that person. So there was there were people dressed up as their favorite bisexual and come to the forum or um, that's one that I remember because it's kind of outrageous and fun. But educational forums, social, speakers bureau, newsletter. The newsletter is really important. The newsletter got so big and so big. Carmen Rossi said in 1990 to the board, I think she goes, I want to do a magazine. It's gotten so big that the newsletter was getting this thing. So um, we said, the board said yes. And ATM grew out of that in 1980. Eight or eighty-nine, I forget. Five hundred uh, was born, and that was, became the social group. I would put a they uh, meant Castro. It was just a social. There's like a balloon or something at the table, just to identify it, and people showed up. And if you wanted to say, "I want to go for a hike next week," you could put it on the calendar, and by friendly people would show up, and you would do it. So it was a great social thing. So by the end of the eighties. Bipolar was the politics, media was the education, and by friendly was the social. And by friendly was started in um, also in Oakland, in the South Bay, Marin, and up in Santa Rosa. So it was quite quite a big um, and successful organizing. Can we have some questions? Awesome. Awesome. There we go. Do you think the world of today compares to what you thought it would look like? Yeah. Uh, wow. Well, I'm that's a big question. Let me look at it. Well, I'm 76, so uh, you put the world compares to what you thought it would look like. Um, I'm not sure if I ever really. Well, actually, no. We, yes, because here you are. When I came out, there was no humanity in the queer community, period. There was nothing. There were a few of us that were visible and out within the lesbian gay community. And so if you were more on the queer side of bisexual, there wasn't a lot of visibility. And I just feel like here we are at the San Francisco Lesbian Gay Bisexual Transgender Community Center. And that this this conference sold out. It's like my wildest dream came true. Is that here we are and what a beautiful you know, it's multi-generational. And I'm so inspired by young people. That's why I'm excited to talk about language. And I might forget my plus because that's kind of the other mind. I've been out in the woods writing my memoirs. So I, I haven't been in the city catching up with things. But um, I, I would say yes, because here you are. I wanted, I did want people to, that isolation is real, it's still real. So reaching out is really important, and that you come here is really important. And um, the other part you can mention is that for me, um, coming from San Mateo Housewife, lesbian, and then into the bi, and to the bi center, I started meeting transgender people at various, various forms of their transition. By transgender people have been part of our community because it's inclusive and welcoming. That's like the bottom line for me is inclusive, welcoming, sweet partner with everybody. How can you be exclusive? And that anytime I hear verses, you know, us versus them, this, that, 
I always, always said to the political strategist, it's like, you're dividing, you're dividing. It's not community. You have to get rid of the verses, always. And, and work it out, figure out, because we're here together. And there's, there's, we're all queer. When the right way was making big moves, big moves in the early 90s, okay, early 90s, they were putting statewide initiatives on the ballot. And um, bisexual communities had gotten big enough that they, they said they included bisexual in there in some of the anti gay statewide initiatives that included transgender people. So we had gotten visible enough for the right way to know that it's us and also to make money off of us, scare people so they can raise funds that we spread AIDS about all of it. Um, that, um, and then the gay lesbian community didn't recognize us. Some of our history is really not pretty. So we were visible enough for the right wing and the religious right to be gone together, but the gay and lesbian community had a long way to go, a really long way to go around that. So um, as I said, some of our history isn't that uh, good, but we worked it out. Here we are. LGBT, I do have to say, I've seen too many times. LGBT, they drop the B, the B is dropped a lot. I, every, so it's still happening, the invisibility piece. And I always encourage you to stand up for yourself. You have a community, there's a movement, and um, yes, the world is in a better place than when I came out in 1980. <laughs> Another question is, how do you imagine a better five-plus world that will come out of your work? That will come out of my work? Or has come out of my work? Well, they say will. I think it'll be there in the future. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think, well, one thing I can say is I'm writing my activist memoir. Uh, it's called My Grassroots Are Showing. <laughs> um, stories, speeches, and special questions. And um, I know when that book comes out, it'll make a huge difference. So much of our history is not out there. All the queer history, all the LGBT, they have to be in their history books now by the big historians. Um, I need to go through the list and I check the book. There is less than a paragraph in most of these big queer history books, gay history books, LGBT history books, nothing. There's nothing there. And all of a sudden in the 90s, the B pops up and they don't even explain how that we got there. Or, you know, there's like this one or two sentence thing. So I think uh, I think my activist uh, memoir is going to fill in a lot of holes in that history, which um, feels exciting, and um, I've been doing this project for a long time. Like I left the city in the early 2000s, um, but uh, I have I I worked on my book, had to let go of the family stuff, and I'm back. And I got diagnosed with ADD about four months ago, and so I feel totally. Um, I was putting myself down a lot because I wasn't getting my memoir done. There's a lot of, it's really important to get out there, and I love and support you and all the stuff you're doing, and I know when my book comes out, it's going to really push things up into the light of our history, and that uh, I was carrying a lot of shame and stuff, and then I got the ADD diagnosis, and I go, yes! <laughs> <laughs> no wonder I have a million stories written, and I can't figure out how to get in the book, so I got, I figured out how to get in the book about two months ago. So um, I'm really hoping that when I finish that project, it will help lift all of us, uh, all our history up. Thank you, Martin. That's brilliant. <laughs> Do I get a 15 like in the, the Olympics or a 15 <laughs> 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 So, um, so uh, I think that the book is going to make a big difference because it will make our history uh, visible. So, um, not another question, I'll go to the 1990 conference, um, which the organizers here, and it's interesting. We did say, we thought maybe we'd have 100 people, so we offered free housing. <laughs> uh, and it was held during Pride Week, 
And we kept, it was amazing. We had Mission High School, and 464 people showed up to free mountain. Not all of them. <laughs> but it was a full map where we were having people in Kensington Hills and all over the Bay Area. But it was 464 people, 20 states, five countries showed up from all. It was phenomenal. And one of the tracks was to help solidify Binet USA. What they meant, if the name wasn't Binet USA then, but that's what it, uh, it uh, went into. And I got that up. 1987, there was a march in Washington, uh, first thing in Washington, Washington. And um, the, we all got on the phone, and we're going to have a contingent for the march in Washington in 87. And I remember walking into that room, there were 75 leaders from around the country, and I thought to myself, we have a national movement. Oh my God, we have a national movement here. These are people from 75 years. You know, all around the country, and of course, we've got everybody. We had a good experience. We marched as a contingent in the parade, and the Boston Bisexual Women's Network put a flyer together that said, Are we ready for a national bicycle organization? And they called Michael and said, Did you put your, your phone number or what's the phone address on it? And within three weeks after that march, we had two shopping bags this full of mail saying, Yes, we're ready, we're ready. Full of money. It was over five hundred dollars. People sent cash to help. It was like, oh my God, what are we gonna do? And Autumn and I are just sitting there. Oh, the bike pole people, sorry. It was Autumn Courtney, Arlene Prance. Bonnie Cumberland, Bill Mack, David Rubenstein, Alan Rockley, and David Fourier. Those are the seven of us in 1983 who uh, founded Bible. And um, Autumn, a little bit about Autumn, she worked her way through the parade committee and became co chair of the parade in 1986. The first out bisexual anywhere in the country to have that level of visibility. And uh, she had to fight. Community meetings. I don't know if you were there, John. <laughs> it was pretty uh, amazing. But she she was co-chair of the uh, parade in '86. Um, so the march on Washington. I'm all over the place. Thank you, Lady D. The guy, the psychiatrist, the the, the test me. Oh yes, you're under the umbrella. And he just looks at me and goes, "But I'm not going to put you on meth because you said it would ruin your life." <laughs> <laughs> Do you know anything about the way the bi community was swept under the rug by the marriage equality movement? Do you know anything about it? Yeah, I knew it wasn't quite as involved with that, but um, it was gay and lesbian marriage, gay and lesbian marriage. Uh, when it should have been same sex marriage, same sex marriage. And um, they kept, it was everywhere. The media, totally erasing us, totally erasing us. And um, I called it an action. Martin, Martin, are you here? Martin was part of an action, the unveiling. Wasn't that what it was called, Martin? Uh, yes, uh, I was uh, unveiling um, equality. Unveiling what? Equality, I believe. Unveiling equality. Oh, I'm failing quality, and it was at a big public meeting that National Center for Lesbian Rights was part of, and they... Here, upstairs. Up, oh, upstairs, that's right. And uh, the bisexuals came in bridal veils. Shelby was there, too. And um, came in, and uh, they have a, there was like a cake on the table. This is before anybody arrived, and it said, bisexuals exist, it's a big way. You know. <laughs> and, um, and there was a statement, words matter, that when this is an orange road, it was brilliant. And um, why you have to say same sex because it erases bisexual people. Do you say bisexual plus or is it bi plus? Bi plus. I can't hear it. Bi plus. Bi plus. Drop in the second. Mommy and I have been living in the woods. 
So part of that, uh, Martin, could you come up here and say a little bit about that? Because that's an important question. What, have, what I know, because I wasn't part of that action, Martin, do you hear? 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 Do <laughs> and and uh, we, we, you know, we, we basically did the whole, the whole, I think I'm trying to get down to the brain, sorry. Um, <laughs> <the brains>. um, <laughs> so I, we, um, we all walked in, and um, Jean and Maggie, uh, obviously, and um, uh, several other people, uh, Linda Susan and Emily, uh, I have a video of it, um, of, of actually them. Um, the nails up, um, but uh, uh, you know, walked in silently. We made the protest. It was beautiful. Uh, um, I ended up on the cover of the VAR with my daughter, um, and then they took it off of the online version because I'm a kid, and so they. Um, <laughs> those are things that happen. <laughs> Yeah, um, there was there was there was an acknowledgement, um, and it was it was a real acknowledgement. Like we had no idea, kind of, you know, callous or disregard, but um, we had no idea that this was actually happening this way. We're sorry. We can make this better. And it was, and they did, and they did. They they changed the dialogue. They changed it to same sex marriage. Everywhere you went, was same sex marriage. It's sliding back nowadays, um, but. But that acknowledgement and that help was huge at the time. Huge at the time. Yeah, National Center for Lesbian Rights did that. So, give them some props. Six more minutes. Six more minutes. Okay, any more questions? Well, wasn't there a letter you wrote to you that time, Mike? Oh gosh, I've written so many letters. That's one of my kind of my MO is like speaking isn't easy for me at all, but I can write a dynamite letter. <laughs> Just right in there. Uh, they'll be in, those will be in my book. Um, yeah. I don't know, I can't recall who I wrote it to, but I challenged everybody from Elizabeth Burks, the head of the Human Rights Commission. Um, all the executive directors got letters to me. Sometimes it shifted, sometimes not. But um, I have the I have the, the letters. That's the thing I miss about having email and stuff. Is having letters, you know. I save emails. I do. I can't help that. Um, because it's good history. But when you send a letter to somebody that is um, in your face, respectfully. Um, it does make a difference, and then you have that record, and when they send something back, it's really good. My archives are going to go to the, um, I have saved everything, okay, <laughs> which is a good thing and a bad thing. Um, uh, the LGBT Historical Society, so it's going to get my archives and all my memorabilia. I even have the timeline for that. <laughs> One of the main coordinators of the 1990 conference, so I even had the timeline of online living in the wall for a year and a half when we were planning it. So um, that's going to be great because they were, they're working with the city now, an actual building, a building so they can have displays with, they have like Harvey's suit and uh, the chair from his office. So there's like amazing things. So the bisexual community will, um, will have. About Lots of stuff there. The, the society already has all the ephemera from anything that moves. Yes. Yes. Um, I have a question. Oh, good. Uh, you talked 
much about the plot. Yes. And one thing that I noticed in social justice organizing generally, not just social justice organizing, there's a lot of anger. And yeah. so how, like then, at, at that point in time, the 80s and 90s, how, how was the anger kind of incorporated into the plot? How do we reconcile that? Well, when you do release, um, like at the parade, doing things that are a little edgy, a little out there, to, to, um, because nobody's going to join you unless you have fun, and if you're walking around like this all the time, then, you know, you can't do it. But support of each other, making sure that um, if somebody's having a hard time, it's always okay to say no and just get back. You know, to make clear and to recognize the anger. And as far as community anger, then it was more overwhelmed because so many people were dying and you didn't know why or how. And there was anger too, but the, the sense that your community was dying right before your eyes and you couldn't do anything but grief. I mean, there was memorial services on there. I mean, it was just relentless. So the anger, it was more grief back then. And there was only seven of us in my book and they were organizing within the lesbian and gay community. I was in the lesbian community talking for the bisexual community. Autumn was on the parade committee talking for the bisexual community. Maggie was in the democratic clubs and the other things talking about it. We were, it was all smoke and mirrors. It was really only seven of us. <laughs> and then, and then, and then um, let's see, Bill was a student at San Francisco State. Alan, was a psychologist and wrote letters to the editor at every game of the ministry, every week of his wife, letters to the editor, but they would change the heading to be by Fogic, which was always a thing. Um, and David was in HIV AIDS health. So we were all representing him. And the anger piece, I'm not exactly, mostly what I, when I think about the 80s is the grief, and we have to do something. Have to get our community visible to have a cohesive, viable community and, um, and movement. But the movement or politics and strategy is organized getting to the community visible. Yeah, I think that in the 90s and the 2000s, um, there wasn't as much anchor as there was in the 80s or in the present. So we, I think we did have a lot of fun. I think being edgy helped a lot. Um, I remember my very first fundraiser I did was to um, do a, organize a sex party for ATM, and that was, that was fun. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you can do that now. Well, I, I encourage you to do that now. <laughs> and like, for example, um, I would organize a food at Folsom, which was always fun. And it was a lot funner than the food at Friday. Because it was just edgier, it was just funner, and that's I think that that helps a lot to bring these in. And then food and socializing and sex. It's all
it's got a free range chicken in some space. With my website. So if you want to grab that, um, that would be great. And I'll get it out as soon as I can. So let me know my lap because I want to make documentaries on bisexuality. And bisexuality. And I thank you so much. Thank you.